What's up? What's up? What's going on? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're back again. Where we at? Gorilla Intellectual University. Is this where we at today? That's where we at today. Okay, okay. Who's who's that we have on board today, Doctor Ball? What's going on here? Well, obviously, it's the Doctor Joy James who is joining us as our co-host this morning, and it's. a wonderful addition and today i can't think of a better way to actually celebrate what is today my daughter's 17th birthday Mm -hmm. so i know that (laughs) in addition to dr king and some other things happening that that's okay okay (laughs) dr king's cool too huh what's going on yeah yeah yeah, absolutely happy birthday uh young 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 ball my uh, my see ball my see day happy birthday Yes, Thank yes, you very yes, much. Yes. Right on, Beautiful right day. on. Beautiful day. 17 is a mean year. Um, yes, Dr. Joy James, what's happening? How you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to see both of you. I'm very excited about our guest this morning, yes, Rosemary Neely. Right yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. So we have a, a serious guest today um, talking about some, uh, some beautiful things, including um, what I've learned to be... Um, probably one of our most important uh, pieces of work or literature that um, that that uh, is available. And I think that folks definitely need to uh, hop up on it. Um, but without further ado, I think that we need to bring her on board. We have with us live here today, Dr. Rosemary Mealy, and she um, is stepping up to the plate right about now. Right on. And among many other things, Dr. Mealy is a recognized and noted international human rights activist. She is author of Fidel and Malcolm X, Memories of a Meeting, Black Classic Press 2014. Shout out to Black Classic Press. Activism and disciplinary suspensions, expulsions at historically black colleges and universities, a phenomenological study of the black student sit-in movement, 1960 to 1962, Articles and chapters and incomprehensible omission, women and El Haj Malik El Shabazz in a lie of reinvention, correcting Mal- Mar- Manning Marable's Malcolm X, edited by yours truly and my main man, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, also on Black Classic Press. The Crisis of Race, Gender and Prison Industrial Complex, uh, African New World Studies uh, as well. Uh, Dr. Mealy is also a longtime friend of Cuba, where she worked as an international journalist for Radio Habana Cuba. In 2011, Dr. Mealy was petitioned by the Cuban Institute for Friendship with the People Friendship with the People, where she was awarded the Friendship Medal by the Council of State of Republic of Cuba. This past September through November, she was an invited lecturer at the University of Havana's Foreign Language Department. Mealy is the recipient of several outstanding reporting awards from the National Association of Black Journalists. She was a former member of the Black Panther Party and served as the NGO rep of the National Alliance Third World Journalist. Dr. Mealy has been an adjunct assistant professor at the City College of New York. Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, and she currently serves on the board of IFCO Pastors for Peace, the New York, New Jersey, Cuba Sea Coalition, and is a member of the National Conference of Black Lawyers. And she is also the inaugural guest here on Guerrilla Intellectual University. So good morning, Professor Mealy. It's great to have you with us. Oh, good morning. I didn't know I was an inaugural guest. You know, I did some... Um, I, I went online, right? I said, well, let me just see what this gorilla, this gorilla thing is about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew, and then Joy, Joy invited me. Well, listen, I've heard you guys. I've listened to you. Sometime I disagree with you, but I like you. I love you anyway. Um, yes. But I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Joy. And I love being inaugural. That's great. It makes me, it makes me feel good. Yes. Right yes. on. Good day for that. Good day for that. Well, definitely, we we are again excited about having you on um, because your your work. I mean, first of all, just hearing your bio, I feel like I haven't done enough up until this very moment. I was like, yeah, okay, I can go uh, go go retire in movement heaven. But then I heard your bio. I'm like, oh, I'm sleeping on the job. Let me get up and uh, go build a city or something. So definitely, we appreciate you and your your work. So you know, welcome again. Yeah. Just standing on the shoulders of those who went before me, I always say now and, and even after. So thank you so much. Yes. 
Wow, Joy, you look great at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Wait till 10. Um, okay. So there's so uh, much there's so much to talk about. I know we have some slides as well. There's your book, your amazing book. And um, I also just want to share a quick story. I don't know if you'll remember this, but I remember when you organized um, a book, it wasn't exactly a book signing, right? Because people were offshore, but you know, for the sister and it was in the Harlem state office building, I believe. And I ended up teaching, you know, her memoir for years, but my encounter was not through, I mean, you're an intellectual and you're a teacher, right? But it wasn't through the university. It was through the community in Harlem. And this is the guerrilla intellectual, right? The way in which you care about history and you care about analyses, right? But also you codify them within covers, book covers, so we can preserve it. And going there, and that was how I first got my book, you know, and was, you know, for years, I mean, people, I mean, teach her through their classes forever, but I didn't find her in a bookstore. I found her in, you know, what you organized there in the irony of it being in the federal building, right? And I just thought that was a brilliant strategic move and, and a gift from an intellectual herself. So again, my appreciation that we can be in conversation with you. Oh, thank you for for that history. Um, well, actually, that you know that book emerged from the community, and that's why it has not necessarily been been. That's why it has not necessarily been viewed as a an academic treatise. You know, it's it's not it's not written uh, from an quote unquote an academic perspective. I deliberately wrote it in a different format that we can talk about. But I remember that that was one of the first book parties uh, signings that we had. And also from that, you then um, did a, uh, you were probably one of the first scholars to actually do a review of the book. And um, you sent me a copy, but I already had it. It came from the Journal of African and Afro-American Studies. And I was just, you, I just felt so great that, that this sister would, would do this because, you know, the book was kind of laid out as, you know, it's just a book, you know, by some, by some, but it, it was the community. It was the, it, it was our community that embraced the book. And also the fact that it was the Cubans that embraced the book as well. So I want to thank you for, for being the activist scholar that you are, that you had the vision to, um, to even do a review of it. So thank you. I owe, I owe you a thanks. I owe thanks to you too. So should we start talking about the book then? Fidel or Malcolm and Fidel? Right on, right on. No, that's, that's, that's definite. Um, I mean, I guess a good way to start would be, you know, I, I heard about this meeting that you all had in 1990, I believe, in, in Cuba, right? And I think that was kind of the, what what jump started this idea? So can you kind of talk about that meeting and then go back to the meeting in 1960 with uh, Fidel and Malcolm? Sure. Well, as as it was mentioned in my um, bio, um, I was a member of the Black Panther Party, and I also, um, after leaving that, I joined the National Alliance of Third World Journalists, and I continued my activism even though I had been expelled quote from the Black Panther Party. I'm on the same cover of the Panther paper that the Ruben Ben Wahad is on as we being quote unquote enemies of the people. So I, I mm -hmm. had to find a, a, a new a new way as a as a as a woman of African descent. I had to reinvent, there's that word, I had to reinvent myself. How am I going to continue to go forward um you know, as an activist and doing what I know is necessary to do. So I was invited to um, to come to, well, at, around during the period of the 80s, as people may know, and as some people do not know, and as people are learning, the attacks against Cuba were ferocious from attempts at assassination of the president of Cuba, President Fidel Castro, to the point of actually um, developing a really massive anti-Cuba campaign by, uh, by the forces in this country through uh, Radio um, Marti 
And Radio Marti would fly over Havana and uh, drop pamphlets and what have you on the uh, Cuban populace. And this was supposed to, people were supposed to, Cubans were supposed to read this information and been, been be a part of, of developing uh, internal conflict and actually overthrowing the government. So it's, it's, it's at this point that I'm invited to come to Cuba to work at, um, at, at, at Radio Havana, Cuba. And uh, during my time there, uh, one day someone came to, um, my, so someone came to my, to my apartment and they said, um, there's, I saw a sister in the bodega who looks like um, freedom fighter Asada Shakur. So I said, you saw Asada Shakur in the bodega? And the person said, yes, I know it's her, I know it's her. And I said, well, you know, um, I don't think that's true. I really don't think that's true. So <laughs> there's some parts of this story I can't tell, but anyway, I'll do the, you know, I'll do the quote unquote, the legal part. So I said, okay, the next time you see this person, if it's really her, would you tell her that I would like to meet her because uh, her, her phone number and address and everything was found in her papers when she was arrested. And later on, I was under surveillance for years as being the person that had hid her out in a safe house in Philadelphia. And so, and so the, the person said, oh, that's an incredible story. So I said, okay, the next time you meet the person, would you tell them to call me? And sure enough, I get a call from this little voice that says, hello, I'm so-and-so-and-so, and, so and, so, and I'd like to meet you. So that was how I actually met our freedom fighter, Asada Shakur. Well, we developed a very strong relationship and um, during that period, I had never, I obviously I had never met her before, even though we had been in the party around the same time. And you all have covered her story here on, on this program. Um, I don't talk about her situation now, so I don't want anybody to call me and ask me, do I know where she is? I know nothing, okay? Um, but anyway, we started meeting and we started having political discussions and so she said to me, you know, it was also around the time that there was this real um, upswing on, on X. Everybody wants to know about Malcolm X. So you find these X t-shirts. Malcolm was being commercial, commercialized. And so Asada said, you know, we really need to, to bring this whole issue of Malcolm to Cuba. Um, and of course, the Cubans knew about Malcolm. They had... Um, they had actually translated his 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 uh, his bio into Spanish. Uh, his uh, he was taught uh, in the in its universities, uh, language schools. His intonation for young journalists. Uh, you could find a radio journalist and you talk to that person, and they would have the intonations of Malcolm's voice. You know, so Malcolm was known in Cuba, and he was revered and he was loved. And so Asada suggested that maybe we should have a conference there, okay? And so I said, fine, you know, let's, let's, let's do that. So she, she, on that end, approached the Cubans about having a conference to um, raise up the, the significance of Malcolm X. And I, on the other side in the U.S., my role was to galvanize support and to get interest from quote-unquote intellectuals and activists who might be interested in helping us to support pulling together a conference like that. Well, I got very, as the book will tell you, and I think that's an important part of the book to lay out the history of how that conference actually took place. I didn't get that much support in this country from, from quote unquote, the intellectuals. People didn't want to go, they didn't want to fly there. But Cuba came to the they just, I mean, they made this the biggest thing. I mean, it was the conference ended up being folks came from Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, scholars, Cuban scholars developed papers and learned there was so much about X, you know, that it was just incredible. And so, so that's how the con and the conference took place at Casa de las Americas, which is like uh it's it's like the center, the hub of intellectual thought in Cuba and publications and what have you. And uh, Nancy Morijon, who's a well-known Cuban poet and writer, um, she was one of the hosts, but then there were hundreds of Cubans who came out and, and the Cuban scholars who actually um, 
had papers and presentations and scholars from the Caribbean. And Kwame Toure came, flew in from, from Guinea. And uh, everybody, all these people just converged on, 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 on the Havana capital. And it, it all started because of this conversation that the sister and I had had during the, some of those wee hours that we would be talking about events and activities, political, the political realities of what was happening in the US. That's how the conference, Malcolm X speaks in the 90s, um, that conference. Okay, so now fast forward. The challenge was, I was given the challenge of saying, let's put these conference um, proceedings into a book form. And I mean, I had, I had, I had never, I'd only published poetry. I didn't know, I had never published, you know, a book of this magnitude. And the book, people think that the book is a thousand pages, but it's, it's only like maybe a hundred, a little over a hundred pages. But there was a publisher from Australia who um, who published books? Uh, uh, yeah, I have a block on on the name right now. I think it's Ocean uh, Ocean Ocean Press. Press Ocean mm -hmm. Press. The block is there because we ended up with a very negative experience. But okay. that being said, um, the book was I was given the task of coming back to the U.S. and trying to locate as many of the uh, brothers and sisters who had experienced. The, the meeting or the event of, of that, um, that 19th of September when Fidel came to Harlem. And sure enough, uh, I'll never forget, um, I raise up his hand, Brother Preston Wilcox, um, who uh, just a very important scholar in his own right. Uh, he, he was like my mainstay. And then there was a Brother Ilambe Bratt from New York, um, who then led me to all these other elders who I then began to interview. And what I did, uh, okay, so, so that's, the book came together because of the community and the response. And I only had like, I think it was like four months to really put together, four months to put together the book. And in four months, I went all over New York, traveled to other parts of the country, locating elders who knew Malcolm, who had had that experience of being at the Hotel Teresa or in the streets. Um, when when Fidel came to Harlem, and so that's how that's how the book came into being, um, and so I used yes. No, I no. This is great because I'm sorry I wasn't clear in the beginning because you've done so many things, Rosemary. You you forget how much stuff you've done, but the book that I was first talking about that you introduced me to, that was Asada's memoir because you organized that book signing. And that was just before I was going into the academy to teach. And oh, so I'm just giving you your props again. It's it's the book about Malcolm, yes, but you've also been instrumental in getting other books or other literature out to the public. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, well, that that was, yeah, that was important because when that book, when Asata's book uh, came out, Asata, um, again, it needed, publication. It needed, it needed, people needed to know about it. So you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, we got together and we organized uh, that event at, um, at the Harlem State Office Building. So mm -hmm. I, I was a bit confused because my book was also launched at the Harlem State okay. Office Building. Okay, so we, we have that straight. Okay. But yeah. I had not met, I had not met Asata when, when that book was, uh, when her book was published, but I knew her mother, her, her aunt, Evelyn Williams, the attorney Evelyn Williams, and we had a very close relationship. And so we did everything that we could to popularize that, that important book. And that's a very important book. I'm, I'm looking at these, these pictures right now, these photos. And, you know, of course, they're iconic photos. But I, I want to point out um, to, to the viewers, you're looking at 34-year-old Malcolm and 33-year-old Fidel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, so, and, and I mean, this is this is in Harlem. I, I want to, if you could, talk about uh, how that meeting came about because so many folks don't know because they look and they see, okay, here is a a a Cuban um, um, sitting official, a dignitary, and you have Malcolm, who is not a head of state, but to a large extent, he's a head of state uh, unofficially. Can you talk about that meeting and how it came about? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What happened um, right on the heels of the Cuban Revolution? 
um, Cuba was courted, let me say courted, 1959, 1960, by the United States government. Um, this was just before uh, Cuba declared itself, and it, it, it was, it, well, it, it declared itself a socialist state, that it was moving for, toward so, to being developing a socialist state with a socialist economy, having natural, uh, nationalized uh, the, the US corporations and you know, turning the land back to the people. But the UN General Assembly was being held in 1960 and Fidel was um, heads of states from all over the, the globe were attending this, this important UN uh, General Assembly. And so when Fidel's delegation arrived in New York, um, there was this a hotel called the Hotel, uh, you have the Teresa, the Shelburne Hotel, which is in proximity to the uh, Cuban mission at the United Nations. And when the, in, in my discussion and in my interviews uh, with Raul Roa Khoury, who was a young Cuban diplomat, um, he told me that um, they got very, they were ill-treated to begin with when they walked into the Shelburne Hotel with their fatigues on. And, um, you, know, it was a, you know, it was a multiracial delegation, Juan Almeida, who's a gen black general, um, they, Cuban general, they all walked into the hotel and, and you know, they were looked at as, as who, you know, hoodlums, quote unquote. And then um, the hotel manager told them that they would have to deposit um, more than $20,000 to stay in the hotel. And, um, and so um, Fidel said, uh-uh, no, we, we, ain't, we ain't doing that. Yeah, uh, no way. Okay, we are not going to do that. It's exorbitant. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's outrageous. So Fidel said, okay, what we're going to, what we're going to do is we are going to set up tents on the grounds of the United Nations. That's where we're going to stay because we're not staying in this hotel. Okay. So um, of course the UN was, you know, the authorities there and the secret service, they, you know, they're like, okay, we, what are we going to do? So, so one of the, um, former, well, actually he was still an ambassador, but under still being assigned as a Cuban ambassador under the Batista regime, because they had not transferred the total, the government, total government at that point. And so uh, the, the old ambassador said, well, look, I'll, I'll find another hotel. So he's talking about the Waldorf Astoria of, he can, we can stay there. And so Fidel says, no, we're not staying there. So, um, there was an organization called Fair Play for Cuba. Mm -hmm. And this organization was in the forefront of having solidarity with Cuba. And, uh, and also as a journalist whose last name was Matthews, who had actually uh, interviewed the, uh, the, the rebel, quote unquote, rebel army in the Sierra Maestas and had interviewed uh, Fidel in, in, in the July 26 movement, which is what it was called. And, it was very important for his information to get out in, in, the, um, in the New York Times. And that was some of the first ways in which people in, in this country uh, learned about the importance of the Cuban revolution and, and what, well, prior to why there was this Cuban revolution and who was involved in this revolution. So along with Matthews and the um, Fair Play for Cuba Committee um, and, and the, the, the young diplomat, uh, and he's very important, and by the way, he's still alive, Raul Ruakuri said that he said to, um, to members of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, well, look, we, we really need to try to find some place for this delegation. We can't, you know, we can't stay on the, on the grounds of the UN. And, and so Malcolm X had El Haj Malik Shabazz, he presented, um, he was a part of a community organization a Harlem community-based organization that was responsible for um, kind of keeping things cooled out in the neighborhood. And also around the time of the UN, people, UN uh, Africans and what have you, they were all gonna be coming to Harlem. Malcolm heard about the situation of, of the Cuban delegation. And so he, uh, along with the committee that, well, Malcolm was in the, in the forefront of this, invited uh, Fidel and the delegation to come up to Harlem. But before that could happen, other negotiations had to take place because the Hotel Teresa was owned 
by a brother named Mr. Love B. Woods. I raised up his, his, his name today. Love B. Woods owned the hotel. And so negotiations had to take place of having this delegation come to Harlem. Who's going to pay for it? You know, this is, this is, it, this is a time of enormity. You know, uh, I mean, it's like you can't just have this, this group come in here and for free. So in, my, in one of my interviews with, um, with an attorney uh, who is, and we'll talk more about his name, uh, a, a, a brother said, told me that they had to find the money to get him to, to get the delegation to Harlem. So Bumpy Johnson, who's a well-known figure, a well-known character in our history, uh, Bumpy was a big time number, Bolita, a numbers dealer. And it's not lore, but Bumpy put the money up. He backed, <laughs> he backed uh, the delegation stay at the Hotel Teresa. This is, in, this is in the book, you know, and the story mm -hmm. is very clear from quote unquote, the horse's mouth. So the Harlem delegation packed up in the 19th, um, 10 days, they just moved on out of there on from downtown Manhattan and they moved on up to Harlem. And, um, and so of course, arriving Malcolm was the host. And that night um, in one of the narratives in the book, uh, Sarah Wright, who was a member of the Harlem Writers Guild, a very known one of our, another one of our very well known authors, uh, she she writes that um, it was thousands of people were out front that night. The the Nation of Islam had organized the security uh, because Malcolm had not he he was still in the nation at the time. And then there was all the leftists and, and the coloration of the the uh, the col the colorism. Of the of the folk outside, it's just amazing. Dominicans, black uh, Panamanians, because it was a large Panamanian uh, community in Harlem. Everybody was there. So around midnight, Malcolm goes up to the to the room and he's greeted. He's greeted by Fidel. And and the picture that is up now, that's Mr. Love B. Woods on the right hand side. He paid a big price for for doing what he did. Uh, at some point, we could talk about that. You may want to note that, Joyce. Uh, talking about COINTELPRO, he was a victim of COINTELPRO before we even started talking about COINTELPRO and Black political prisoners. Um, so that's that's what happened. The meeting was short. Um, and in my uh, interview with um, uh, Ronaldo Pinaver, who was one of the Black Cuban journalists that accompanied um, the delegation, he told me that it was pleasant, um, they chatted, and um, there's in the book, there's actually a, a small summary of what they actually talked about. I won't tell anybody here, but what they actually talked about. Uh, you got to tease people to stay online, you know, in programs like this. Um, <laughs> and you want to make sure that people uh, buy, purchase the book right, and the book. read it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because we don't want to tell the whole story. But um, that's, that's kind of like how it happened. I hope that I mean, I know I went a roundabout way, but I always, I'm always conscious that I sat in you all's shoes, you know, and you don't want your interviewer to like take off and go someplace that you can't bring them back in control. So yeah. I'm going to yeah. kind of stop there. This is awesome because you, you dropped so many nuggets just in that, in that little piece. And I, I want to point out because again, this is the importance when we talk about guerrilla intellectuals, right? This is the importance because you look at someone like Malcolm who had a connection to the streets and many folks don't know. You mentioned Bumpy Johnson. When Malcolm left the nation, Bumpy offered to give him 200 men for backup for security. Wow. And, and, and Malcolm said no, because he didn't want, you know, want things to go in the wrong direction. So, you know, it could have it could have had Malcolm not been so uh, sharp. There could have been a serious war and it could have been serious bloodshed. Um, so I just wanted to add that since you mentioned uh, Bumpy, but oh, um, that's good information. Thank you. Yeah, I want I want to want to bring it back, and and I I don't and 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 this is uh my co-host. You all can jump in. I'm I'm just trying to keep the flow. So forgive me if I look like I'm 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 hogging up the rope. But um I I want to from that meeting, what was the um the how did how did the uh, relationship between um. Cubans and, and Africans here in America 
uh, events because you mentioned that it was it was a brief meeting. So it wasn't like it was, you know, days or whatever. But, yeah. but talk about the impact of that meeting, if you don't mind. Of course. Oh, by the way, the, attor the black attorney, the noted attorney was Brother Conrad Lynn. That's another name that oh, we yeah. need to put in. We need to put his name into our entire uh, uh, being a part of our, his our, our her stories and our histories. Um, OK, so what that you know, there had been relationships between. Of course, there had been relationships between Cuban Africans in this country and Cubans prior to the trying for the Cuban Revolution. This was not the doing during the enslavement period. I mean, um, some of our, our greatest um, uh, uh, historians and, and leaders uh, had met with Jose Marti and then the abolitionist movement. So there was always this connection between black folk in Cuba and, and here. But that meeting solidified, it was like, it was symbolic, but it solidified the continuum of our relationship between the two peoples. Our, our relationship is connected by a shared history. Um, as we often say, during the enslavement of our people and when the boats arrived in, the, in, in this part of the, uh, of the hemisphere, the boats kept going, going south and into Cuba and Nicaragua, El Salvador, all over Venezuela, all over Latin America, the Caribbean. And so that connection, that there was a historical connection. And so that meeting, as I said, it, it solidified this political legacy that already existed, but in the context of a revolutionary situation, in the context of a socialist construct. And one thing that Malcolm did say to Fidel was, you have done everything in your country that we're still struggling to do. So he was, he was conscious politically conscious of, the, of this transformative process that was occurring as a result of the Cuban revolution. Um, the, the, the whole push to, for education, for dealing with a, the question of literacy, healthcare, I mean, uh, dividing lands up, the agrarian reform movement that dispersed the land to those who did to the peasants. So that, and getting rid of the gangsters, you know, getting rid of, of the, the basis of, of what had was had destroyed the the Cuban reality? You know, the, the Cuban was known as the showplace of 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 Meyer Lansky. You know, the biggest gambler and crook next to Trump in in this in the in <laughs> during that period. You know, just running casinos, the prostitution, black women being uh, used in that way, black black working class people at the bottom of the totem pole, all the things that we that was being experienced in Harlem and in the US with us, Cubans, the revolution was laying the framework, that experience was laying the framework for shifting and changing that reality, but it was doing it because it had over it was overthrowing capitalism. And that was a real threat to the United States of America and still is after 60 plus more years. So mm -hmm. went around a bit, but I think that and see, that's the other thing. In Cuba, young people know about Malcolm X. -y. You know, as I mentioned earlier, in the language schools, you know, his speeches are are are, are listened to by by young Cuban journalists and writers and all and who have what have you. And by the way, um, a lot of people don't know this, but I would hope that if you decide to travel to Cuba. And I really want you to visit there. You can still go under the 12 categories that deny us the right to travel. But the thing about it is there is a park in the Vedado section of Havana. It's a, it's a park dedicated to Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. So today in that park, on one side of, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, the, the granite, the granite stone with the image of Malcolm on one side and on the other side, the image of Martin Luther King. That's in this, that's, I, there's nothing like that anywhere else in the world, right? So the symbolism exists in Cuba about the significance of Malcolm X that we don't even, and it's not commercialized, that we unfortunately, because of the educational system in this country, and the commercialization of our heroes and heroines, we don't we don't embrace that history. We don't know that history. And Cuba keeps that history. Cuba keep, is keeping that history alive for us. And people just, 
I mean, we don't even understand that we are not just, I mean, they keep the history alive because Cuba is international. It's an internationalist framework that propels them. Not, you know, there's Ho Chi Minh. I mean, there are other heroes and heroines in, the, in their parks that they create, but just to go to there and to actually go to a park where Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are lifted up as a part of the uh, part of our global history, our international history, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, it makes me think, right? Um, or reminds me, so thank you, of the importance of international intellectualism, right? Or, you know, international guerrillas. Because also you mentioned in the book that Malcolm had plans to meet with Che Guevara and Guevara was not able to because of certain conflicts of scheduling whatever happened, but he did write a note to Malcolm with his regrets that they could not make these connections. And then when I think of Malcolm, I believe if this is correct, going to the UN, you know, a couple of years later with the We Charge Genocide, the 1951 document that the Civil Rights Congress put out, Du Bois signed did William Patterson mm -hmm. write about the violence, the systemic structural violence, genocidal violence against people of African descent. And so when I'm listening to you, Rosemary, start thinking about the debates and the battles around critical race theory, but I'm also thinking how CRT, as important as it is, as a liberal construct, doesn't even come close to what you're talking about in terms of, you know, these struggles for liberation that are not just intellectual, but material, but also understanding the importance of, of socialism and the and dealing with anti-blackness, however we're gonna define it, in ways that go beyond integrationist you know, aspirations. I mean, there's a real struggle that you can see with Malcolm, the real struggle you can see with Fidel. And, and Cuba's not perfect, right? I mean, Absolutely I'm not in a while, but you know, there's still, you know, white supremacy, colonialism, that, you know, that lasts yeah. a really long time. But what you said about the workers who were black being forced into these highly hyper exploitation, you know, zones of being sex workers to white tourists from the States to the mob, like running the casinos and the drug trafficking. And so and the U.S. is mm -hmm. like, we're, we're fine with this. There's a lot that Cuba took on and they managed to succeed. So, yeah. I mean, I hope at some point, because you're also with IFCO, and you invited us, the three of us, to go to Cuba. I think that's what you did. Then maybe we could talk more about how the historical flows into the present moment and how we can mm -hmm. build solidarity um, connections as intellectuals, but also as organizers. Yes, I forgot. Um, I didn't say, I'm holding this book up. This is the actual copy of Fidel and Malcolm X translated into Spanish. Uh, it was launched in 19, in 2000, and, uh, what's this, 23, this 2019 at the Havana Book Fair. So they've actually translated, they've actually translated this book mm. for the Cuban readers, but it cannot be sold here in the United States because of the blockade, okay? So that's important for people to know. This little book is not, it's, it's, it's censored, it's, it's blockaded. It cannot be sold here because it's published by a Cuban publishing house. So people need to know the, that's just one little impact of, of the blockade. But you're absolutely right um, about the importance of people going there and seeing for themselves what their reality is, what their reality is and how they're able to embrace this internationalism that we, you know, that that we pay lip service to, we meaning the U.S. pays lip service to. I mean, critically, one of the most important things that Cuba did in recent history, I mean, Cuba contributed to the release of Nelson Mandela. You know, they, they sent their entire a regiment to the Battle of Quito Quanival, a very important battle that actually just jacked up the South African apartheid regime and forced Bolta to the negotiating table and Nelson Mandela um, was liber was freed. And then one of the first places that he went was Cuba, right? To give thanks and, and, and Cubans will tell you um, the only thing that came back from their 
from Africa was their their heroes in in body bags, and they buried them. You know, they didn't bring any minerals and golds, and they didn't negotiate um, for um, to rip off uh, the resources of of Angola and Mozambique and and South Africa. Contrary to what we can say happens here. That was. I mean, there is a small book which you can get in the States. And I'm, I'm trying to think, my brain is like, how can we get around that embargo of, of the Cuban book um, that's in Spanish? And it's uh, the speech that Mandela did when he was in Cuba. And then it's Fidel's speech as well. And I, I believe the title is something like We Who Were Slaves. So even mm -hmm. the way that Castro identified the island as being Black and himself as part of the African lineage, but this is done in 91 and they, they kind of, they're, you know, Mandela's speech comes first in the, in the text and then Castro um, speech follows. And there's this, there's this energy of triumph, you know, and I think you were there in Harlem when um, Mandela came to Harlem, like, you know, I remember mm -hmm. seeing Jeruba on stage with, with Mandela and the March and David Dinkins, the black mayor, is probably the person who allowed all that to happen. But so this is a long way to, to ask you, how do you see, again, like the historical connected to the contemporary and how could we build on this intellectualism? Like some of the texts mm -hmm. are embargoed, right? Because they have the Cuban press imprint. Other texts were Mandela and Fidel Castro or in conversation you can get in the bookstore or teach to your class. But if, if there's a bridge, right, and there is a bridge, how mm -hmm. do you see um, the possibilities for expanding this kind of intellectualism and the book banning against mm -hmm. the Cuban press, right, is another mm -hmm. form of these larger bans or book burnings that are going on oh, yeah. in the U.S. Like Gloria, uh, like uh, Hurston's, their eyes were watching God has been banned. Okay. Um, oh, well, I think they're busy. I think, I think there's a, a very important uh, piece to what you what you just said, and that was and if I may, I can link it to something that happened to me recently. I was invited to teach um, at the University of Havana from the months of of, of September uh, September through November, and I was teaching in the foreign language department, but the text that was used was this book. Uh, and these were young Cuban st students, and I had never seen, there were things that they brought out in this book that they analyzed from this book that I had, I'd never even considered. I had to go back and read the book again. But I raised this question because one of the key uh, questions that was raised in the seminar, how can we take a historical uh, narrative and translate it to the reality of what is going on now? And it it raised, a, the, the Cuban students raised a, a larger question for me that I think fits exactly into to the point that you're raising, that it's, it's building these international bridges that helps us to break through this ban on true intellect, intellectualism, you know, that, that until we're able to understand that we live in a global world we live in a global world and that we're not isolated. It's only when we get to that point can we begin to see then that there are these interconnections between that history then and the reality now, if I'm making myself clear. For example, in the university, as you know, in the university, uh, and this is what's so great about this program, we have to deconstruct the, the meaning of what is academic, you know, the academic, what, what, the, what do we mean by she's an academic or he's an academic, you know, there's this ivory, and this has been going on for years, of course, but now it becomes even more critical because of the attacks within the, within the educational system. Um, this whole bogus idea about critical race theory, I happen to, and I'm proud of it. I graduated from CUNY Law School my last instructor was the great Hayward Burns, who, oh, wow. was, who was a critical race. I was in his last class. And he, he helped to mold me into being a critical race theory scholar, right? And it's all about 
deconstructing the history of this country and looking at the role that law has played, the role that the law has played to capitalize off of our exploitation and to use that exploitation to benefit the system that we're fighting against. So critical race theory is really about the history of race in this country and how race has been used as a tool, as a tool to maintain dominance. You know, that's, that's, that's it, all it is. And that's why the right wing wants to erase that history. They, they want to erase that, they want to erase uh, some of the most, the greatest classics, okay? So, so getting back to your point, when we talk about how does this history relate to today, we as those of us in the, and I don't, I'm only, I'm only an adjunct professor, you know, I, I'm not working this semester. I, my dream was to get a job at, an, at a historically black college, but that never happened. I never got hired in one. But, but just, <laughs> just, to, just to, to frame that, I think at this point, the so-called black scholars and those in, in the academic community, we have to come forward and, and fight against and fight against this. Uh, we have to raise this thing about the bogus, the bogus arguments about critical race theory. We have to fight against the fact that they're saying that we shouldn't be able to teach our history. We should not be able to teach our history. It's okay to teach Holocaust history, but it's not good to teach, we shouldn't be teaching black history because it makes white folks feel uncomfortable or white children will feel uncomfortable. I mean, they're attacking the higher, they're, they're they've gone through K through 12, through 12, and now the focus is on the universities, the state, especially the state-run universities. Here in Florida, where I'm talking to you from right now, the governor has asked every university to submit its critical race history curriculum you know, it would, and, and the fight back is, is minuscule, you know, but academics have to come forward and to say that history is now, you know, history is now. The reality of historical events are occurring at this very moment. And, and we, have to, we have to weaponize that concept ourselves, you know? So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, no, it does. I mean, you're invoking Ron DeSantis. <laughs> it's kind of like it's grounding um, that this is, you know, uh, this is a fight. It's it's not an intellectual debate. It, it, I mean, it's a form of of repression, and and also my appreciation. I mean, thank you for bringing out Haywood Burns, right? Because he also defended political prisoners. So I'm seeing a kind of intellectual who's engaged in struggle on the ground. Like you keep invoking these people. So like, you know, everybody, you have, a, and there's no such thing as a Rolodex anymore. But, you know, every time you're speaking another, um, I don't want to call them heroic figures, but there was heroism, you know, like the, the owner of the Hotel Teresa to invest in a liberation struggle on whatever level comes with penalties. And so I totally agree. And, and I also agree that it, it's not just, you know, from elementary to K, it's also a struggle for the, within the academy. But I'm wondering if you, if you wanna say more about how even among ourselves as progressives, um, a, a, an openness to the radical aspect of what Malcolm stood for, not just his iconic symbolic, and the, the radical nature of the Cubans being able to protect their revolution under whatever, you know, conditions, you know, the special period or a lot of tourism from Europe. How do you, how do you see our standing in terms of us as radical thinkers and not always on the defensive, but, but proactive? Oh, yes. Uh, we have to embrace the ideas of people like uh, Claudia Jones, you know, yeah. who was a, a black woman communist, right? Uh, people like to see her as an organizer. We're talking about the 50s again, going back. Um, we, have to, we have to not fear using terms like socialism and communism. And, and in the way in which we would articulate it and utilize it in our own communities, you know? And 
I like to say, you know, yeah, I'm a black radical feminist, you know, yes, I, I believe in socialism as its applicability to my reality here in the United States of America. But I also think that a lot of, of, of us limit our understanding of the world to, to here, to, to the US. And we don't have a, we, we don't, we refuse to take on a global perspective. This thing, this thing is bigger than us in Harlem. It's, it's, it's a global reality. And if we don't, if we, we used to say the domestic remains in the domestic, why should we take on international struggles? But we have to integrate the domestic with the international. And, and, and one way that we do that, I think with this whole struggle around immigration is, is a great point because many people who are immigrating to the United States are coming from, many of them are professors and academics, but they're coming um, thinking that they're going to be able to get a job in a comfortable academy and they'll be able to, to teach and, and, they don't, and they'll, talk, they'll talk negative about socialism. But we have to, we, those of us who have this consciousness, we have to be creating, we have to be creating new us's. We have to be, I've cloned about 10 students, okay? <laughs> uh, or maybe more uh, that I know of, you know, who are, who, who embrace what we're talking about right here. Um, and they're all, you know, they're spread out all over the country and they're carrying forth. I mean, we have to join organizations like the, the National Council of Black Studies, you know, which is holding on, you know, and, and trying to put forth the kind of radical viewpoints that you and I are talking about. But we, but, but we have to also study, you know, we have to study. And, I, and I'm just not saying we have to study ide ideological texts. We have to study history. You know, people are just hearing about fascism. We've been, mm -hmm. the, the, the black radical professor, the black radical professors have been talking about fascism I mean, that, that's a part of our lexicon. That's a part of our curriculum, so to speak, you know. Um, so I think that there's a fear, you know, that tenure doesn't mean anything anymore. People, sh I mean, you could be ousted for nothing almost, you know. So you, you, have, to be, you have to be a part of a, a cadre. And, and that's why this programs like this or creating this idea is, is really important because you're going to find some of the, folk like us who would who's saying, well, this is a place for me. Maybe this is a place where I can feel safe while at the same time I can continue to carry on teaching and doing and doing what I'm doing. Now, if if the, the governor of Florida her listens or one of his <laughs> one of his flunkies heard this program, they would say, well, there's two people that we would definitely never want to well, there's four people that we definitely would never want to hire could never be hired in Florida because, you know, they carry that critical race theory viewpoint. You know, we can't have people like that. But we're all over the country, but we have to organize. Our, it's about organizing ourselves. We have to organize ourselves. And we can't organize ourselves sitting in, in, a, in a comfortable space at a university. It has to take place outside of the traditional university context, you know, much like we did the liberation schools, you know, um, and, and, and that's, that's what I'm doing now. You know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really working on pulling together people, t teachers, professors who, who wanna study and wanna figure out how, what kind of curriculum can we, can we create that we can, um, that we can share with, other, um, with others who are in the academy that right now are kind of protected like Brother Bell, you know, he's okay. He's not gonna get hot fired right now, I don't think from um, Morgan. You know, people, <laughs> but we have, <laughs> but we have to. Um, Did you just put that idea out there, Rosemary? <laughs> oh no, that idea is is been well oh, in we place for quite a while, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I thought I heard you say that, that at one point that you 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 had some regret at not teaching at an HBCU, and I and. No, no, I said I, I never oh. got the, they never hired me. I was, I, that was, I figured if I could get into one, at least I would have a foothold, you know, someplace, but I never got into one. <laughs> I never <laughs> got to teach at one, right. I mean, I've we spoken have, at one. Oh, we have, we have one for you now. 
uh, Guerrilla Intellectual <laughs> University. So with that in mind, uh, you talked about comfort and being uncomfortable. Um, when you hear Guerrilla Intellectual, what does that mean to you? Because that we're ready. Oh yeah, I, I didn't get the image of the animal. I didn't. That was not an image that I got. I mean, I saw fighters, you know, ready to take take it on, you know, or already taking it on, but f trying to figure out how do we um, how do we disperse it, you know. Let's pull together this cadre of folk and let's, you know, let's just do it. I mean, we the work is we've already done the work. We have curriculums, you know, like. I teach, um, I teach immigrant rights and the law. I also taught a course called the color line. 10 years ago, I had my students doing interactive maps around the US identifying where hate groups were. You know, they could, they could go and I use some of the work from, and you all know about the group in, in Atlanta, the Southern Poverty Law Center with all of its problems. They have these great interactive maps of where hate groups exist all over the United States. And my students could, could go to New York and they could tell you pockets of New York State where hate groups existed, where it just came about during the January 6th uh, takeover. Um, people just, then that hate groups are just beginning to be discussed, you know, and, and they've been existing for years. But in the university, do our students know about that? We don't dare. I mean, some of our, we could use classes that we teach and you could create your curriculum and you have a session on hate groups and what does that mean? You know, you have to be creative and with the, and with the technology, you can do this. You know, we can do this. I mean, we can utilize the technology. I wanna, I want to I enjoy, this gets back to forms that you can use. I want to learn, like the brothers doing at um, Morehouse, I want to learn how to create virtual, virtual interactive classrooms, you know, where, where you can teach the Underground Railroad and, and actually have students interact. Where did those trails go? You know, where did they land? Where did they end up? That we have to skill ourselves also in the technology. And, and because that's, that's where many of our students are and we can do it like on, we can create those kind of, of platforms to do that. We don't have to be in the physical quote unquote academy because we're not all gonna be there for sure. So those are just some of my thoughts. Can I ask very quickly, uh, how does one get an appointment at the University of Havana? Uh, like how, where can I send, like, is there, is there a portal I can submit to? Or are you taking like us a, all with you, Jared? Or you just, I mean, I would absolutely on, do that. I mean, I'm trying to figure something out. I mean, I, you know, any excuse to go back and that would be, you know, anyway. So I was, I, but in, in all seriousness, I, I, I did want to ask, there was something that uh, of, of the many things you raised in your work, uh, and thank you so much for it and for joining us again. Um, I thought it, 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 well, of the many things, one of them was this, you, you talk about, and, and Professor James writes about it in her review, the, the fact that uh, only a handful, I believe only three black journalists were permitted presence uh, or entree to that meeting between Fidel mm -hmm. and Malcolm. And I was wondering if you would say a word or two about that, the importance of that fact and what it says about the black press then and maybe what it says about it today. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, okay, in New York at that time, you had the, um, uh, the Citizens Call, which was a major newspaper. Then you had the Amsterdam News, and then you had the photographers who uh, were freelancers or they worked for either one of those press. Um, the black press at that, at that time, nationally, as you know, the Pittsburgh Courier was still around, there were all the, uh, uh, the, Chicago, the Chicago papers. Uh, there were, the black press was very strong, just like you said uh, then. So they, they were the quote unquote legitimate, quote unquote, within the black community because they are putting out information that's relevant to our reality and, 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 and that's important. So, they had, the black press had legitimacy. And naturally, if you had legitimacy within the black community, the expectation was that you were going to report 
the truth and you were going to report the reality. So those, the, I, in fact, I interviewed the brother who um, was the photographer, and I think I interviewed one of the, um, the, the, the actual uh, journalists. But the other thing that, I, that was even more important, I, I, was, I found out who the owner of the uh, citizen's call was, and he was alive at that time. And he, he had all of his newspapers stored in his archives in, in his apartment on, on Riverside Drive. And he allowed me to come there. And I was able not just to, um, to, to, to read, review how the reporters had, had reported the meeting about the, um, about the meeting between Fidel and Malcolm, but I also went back to some early editions and did a comparison. I found that the Citizens Call paper was far more uh, revolutionary or progressive, say, than the Am even the Amsterdam News at that time. But the citizen call was not viewed as, as note it wasn't as noted as the Amsterdam News. So getting back to, to your question, um, those, those black folk who went up there and had, were privy to the, um, to the meeting, they were done so because they were, number one, they were trusted and they worked for um, reptical newspapers that um, carried the truth about what was going on in our community, about the housing. Jesse Gray, the communist organizer in Harlem who was leading uh, housing struggles. I mean, the, if you go back and look at the Amsterdam news from that time, I mean, the, the Amsterdam news was and the citizens call, they were reporting on the reality of racism and attacks against black folk and the struggles that were going on in, in the community and, and not trying to, um, to report and, and writing in a language that, that the community, that's the other thing, writing in a language that the community could understand, you know what I mean? And um, so, so that's why they were chosen um, because they would, Malcolm, no one number one, Malcolm trusted them, you know. And, and the Cubans ha had their, well, of course, the, the journalists who came from Cuba obviously were, were a part of the, the revolution. And so the two met and uh, those journalists met them. And it was, it was a, a, another aspect of the continuation of the links between the two countries that extended beyond Malcolm because Ronaldo Pinaver, who was the Cuban journalist that I interviewed, uh, he talked about the long-standing relationships that he had with others that he had met in this country. I wanted other blacks. To, uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, go back to the Teresa Hotel. Um, you spoke about uh, uh, Love B. Woods, the uh, owner of the hotel, and you talked about how he had to pay a price uh, that was larger than the price that they had to pay to stay at, uh, at the other yeah. hotel. Can you speak on um, on on the fate? And, yes. Uh, okay. Yes. The mm -hmm. the Internal Revenue um, did a, I guess you could call it <laughs> a guerrilla audit on Love B. Woods in a negative sense, and they um, they wanted to know from him where did he get the money from, or what happened to the money, right? Mm. And he refused to tell them what happened to the money. Actually, what he did. He gave the money, I think it was to his nephew for his college tuition. And, um, and you know, he was, he was, he was, he was charged. I, 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 I need, that's a good point because I need to follow up on actually to find out what kind of, uh, of, of, of other charges were incurred against him. But, you know, it was, he was not able to hold on to the hotel, and, but for a long time and, and then eventually the hotel went into demise, but they forced, they were trying, they forced him to um, expose where he had gotten the money from and he wouldn't tell them. And um, except the fact that we know that he used the money for his relatives, young relatives tuition. Yeah, so, you know, that that's a big price to pay wow. to be harassed like that. Definitely yeah, appreciate okay. you sharing that with us. Yeah. Uh, Professor James, did you say you needed to leave at nine? I don't know. Did you did you want to jump in and and? No, no, I'm gonna. I'm yeah, gonna. Sorry. I'm just. I'm gonna stay longer. Okay. Great. <laughs> I just. I just. I want to hear 
forth from Rosemary and, and right from on. you all. Yeah. Okay. okay, so what time do I leave? Uh, you, you, Whenever you, leave you say you finished. <laughs> this, from this university, what time? <laughs> what time oh, 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 you, you, you with us today. We, we ride a shotgun. <laughs> I would, when the bell rings, I don't know. Right. When, the bell when, rings. when you when you ring the bell, when you say class is over, it's over. Yeah. Uh, that's it. uh, uh, until then, until then, we, we, there's plenty more. You, you you could also give us assignments, and you know. Oh. Okay. We, we All right. Can, to go figure some things out. I'm wondering. You go back to what you said. Um, like, the folks here have more digital skills than I do because I have none. But their skills are solid. Even you know they don't have to be compared to my lack of skill. Um, what it means to move with the youth in terms of education being in a digital platform, right? And what that might look like. Even let's say let's go back to the book that's translated mm -hmm. in Spanish, you know, I started thinking about ebooks, about, ele you know, electronic books. In, in your own book, right, if there's any plan to have it published, not just in physical form, right, but also to be a digital book or an ebook. And if- Oh, it, yeah, it is an ebook. already. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Okay, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. And who's the publisher? Black Classic Press. Um, okay. Our right. brother, Paul Coates, how could we do, do without him? You know, we were in the Black Panther Party together also. So in the Harlem branch, you all were there? No, no he was in Baltimore. Okay. And I was, in, no. I was not in the Harlem branch. I was Where in, were you? I was in Philly and New Haven. Oh, because I met you in Harlem. So I always associated you with the Harlem Panthers, but no, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I wonder. I'd like to hear more about how how you ended up on uh, on that on that cover with the Ruba. <laughs> like what what led to what led to all of that? <laughs> and, and and us meeting in New Haven, knowing the history of the New Haven chapter, uh, rising power of George Edwards. You know. Oh yes, I, yes. I, I I was at I spoke at his memorial. Yes. Oh, you, oh, you guys are shooting so many questions at me. Yeah, yes. I have one more to pile on here. And when will we be able to read your memoir, or is it already out? No, I'm I'm not telling my life story, and I don't want anybody. <laughs> you know, I was tell I was telling people there's a there are uh, there are enough there's enough on the internet and enough interviews that I've had with students that you all can just compile all of that stuff together, and that's my memoir. I'm not that's telling. It. I have no plans. I'm not like our sister Fran Bill, who I love her. Uh, Fran Bill important document piece for those of you listening. Sister Fran Beal was in the, in, the, in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she was, she, was, she was on those brothers' heels, boy. She wrote a piece called Triple Jeopardy. Jeopardy. And also another piece, uh, Slave of a Slave No More. Two pieces, I think. She did Slave of a Slave No More. But Fran is writing, Fran is writing her memoirs. But she's doing it in a very interesting way. And this might be a way for other radical feminists or other radicals to do their memoirs. She's writing her history, her memoir, but she also has a, um, a sister who's uh, in, in academia to take each page of her memoirs and translate it into academic treatises, <laughs> in academic language, right? So it's, it's going to be very interesting because in that way, it's a strategy. In that way, the book will be respected in the academy and will hopefully, and it will also be, I shouldn't say respected, but ex acceptable, right? It will also be a way in which we can use it as a, a grassroots tool for organizing. I think it's a brilliant way to write your memoirs. I don't know if there's anybody else who's done it like that or not, but I think that's brilliant. It sounds brilliant. So let me make sure I understand. So um, one page, it's like a translation. One page, it's the story, the storyteller, the oral history. And then the side page is, this is the academic interpretation or translation of the material reality of the biography. Or it could be not page by page, but I don't think she said page by page or chapter by chapter. I don't recall, but okay. either way, you're going to get these two two perspectives of one that's, person. That's brilliant. 
Actually, By the yeah. way, there's the homework assignment. I see people asking about it in the chat too. The the that the uh, going out and compiling all that is out there on Professor Mealy's life and putting it into <laughs> the memoir, the the unofficial right. or the what did they say? The unauthorized, unauthorized memoir. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Send it to send it to mediablackpowergmail.com. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just gonna have to become book publishers now, right? Oh, right, yeah. Gorilla published by Gorilla Press. You know, that's, oh, that's when right. I, I do want to explain uh, maybe the logo because I think you said something about the animal. I don't know if you're referring yeah. to the logo. Well, the the tree is the Baba, if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it correctly, which is the ancient tree from Africa, right? Thousands of years old. So that's that's our the lineage. knowledge, the not the, the knowledge. knowledge. Yes, it's, yes, yeah. And then the dragon is a dragon. I think um, in the past, like with Jared and with Kalonji, we, we've talked about dragon philosophers, right? Mm -hmm. And their ability to be critical thinkers, their ability to love the people. Everybody has contradictions, but they grapple with those contradictions, right? And they're disciplined by that love. And so that's kind of the images we're trying to weave together for the logo mm -hmm. of Gorilla. Um, intellectual university that's great well thank you well i said i didn't have an image of a of an animal you know a gorilla jumping out at me like gorilla glue or something like that i uh, i think you I did, I, I, might have wanted that <laughs> i, I want to um point out too there is um correct me if i'm wrong an unofficial official unofficial version uh spanish version of your book um is that correct? Coming out of a uh, school or something? I thought I heard you say. Uh, uh, no, I, no, I I said that. Okay, there's three versions. There is there's only one version of the book, but it's been published. Uh, it 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 was okay. You have the the last the last version is the last uh, updated is published by Black Classic Press. Okay, right. okay. Now the first the first publication was done by Ocean Press and they allowed the book to go out of print for 20 years. Yeah, okay? that's why that's why you don't like publishers. I totally get that. It went out of print for 20 years and plus uh, one day I was online and I found my book published in um, in Portuguese because it had been sold to a Portuguese publishing house. Okay. Wow. So I thought you were so going to say you found the PDF. <laughs> No, no. Just the, okay. The, the, the raw PDF somebody had thrown up there. No. Anyway, sorry. but it's possible. It's possible. So there's only one official publication of the book. I now I re retained the copyright at this mm -hmm. this point. Um, the Cuban publication is, I mean, it's it's published by Cuban Press, but it's copyrighted. Um, uh, it gives it's and it lists all of the editions. And it's, pu it's published by the Cuban um, Institute. It's called Libros, Editorial Libros. So that's, that's the, this is the official Spanish language publication of the text. It's smaller, right. you know, and um, so those, so that, that's, that's all. I mean, it, somebody could, um, someone could have, have copied and put it up there. I don't, I don't know, I don't go. No, no, no. I, I thought I and I, I could be wrong. I thought I heard you in an interview talk about um, someone at your granddaughter's school or something. Maybe some teachers that did. Oh, uh, oh, that. OK, no. Hey, when, when did you hear that? Wow, you were just really on it. I, I, okay. I got to research in order to do what I'm doing. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you're talking yeah. about this. OK, um, this is this is Black Classic Press, but yeah. it was published unofficially published in Spanish. This is the unofficial <laughs> publication in Spanish. And actually it was, my granddaughter went to Maryland International Day School, which is the only primarily black multi, multilingual uh, Spanish language school in, in the country, right? My granddaughter went there. And so when I wanted, we were trying, Paul Coates and I, we were trying to get the book published in Spanish uh, to get to be launched at one of the Havana book fairs, and we we needed to find translators. So what happened was the sister who runs the um, 
the, uh, the Maryland Day School, her staff for free translated this, this, but it's, un it's the unofficial translation. Right, right, you are right. so right on it, Kalonji. And then of course, this is the official mm -hmm. uh, Spanish language translation. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, I thought I was slipping. I'm just, I was about oh, to say. Oh no, that. no, you you're right on. You got a, you okay. you, you got you did good. You get an A for that. <laughs> All right, I'm good. See, don't get jealous, Jared. Um, uh, yeah, so and, definitely. Uh, <laughs> and Jared, thank you so much for publishing my piece on um, Malcolm X and, and the women, woman experience. So it's funny you should funny. say that. I was queuing up. To, sh to shamelessly plug and ask you about something you wrote in 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 that book, and it was an honor to to to, to have that contribution. Um, in fact, you said here, when examining a life of reinvention uh, through the through this theoretical lens, I found limited scholarship and a glaring, incomprehensible omission regarding one of the most important aspects of Malcolm's political life his thinking on questions of gender and on how his political relationships with political black women affected his overall perspectives on the question of patriarchy. And I'm just wondering if you would want to say a word or two about that omission in the literature, uh, about Malcolm himself, uh, or anything else, anything else? Right. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yes. I, okay. Oh, uh, I was always interested in um, sitting at the heels of, um, of a sister Vicki Garvin, a uh, black communist, okay? Uh, Vicki Garvin, for those of you who are listening, uh, was a sister who actually um, was involved in revolutionary struggles in the United States. And she was invited by Mao Zedong to come to China where she taught uh, for years in China. And then when, um, when Malcolm, um, she, she also knew Malcolm and, and he respected her. And that was one of the, the political women in his life. Um, there was also uh, sister, um, uh, um, Asian American sister, uh, Yuri. Yuri. Yuri Kochiyama. Yes, how could I forget Yuri? Yuri would all, Yuri's Yuri is the sister for many of you who saw at the Audubon ballroom you see this uh, mm -hmm. sister that's cradling Malcolm's head uh, after he was assassinated well Yuri Kochiyama I also knew her and sat at her heels feet and listened to her stories and her interaction with Malcolm and then of course there was another sister named um Thelma, I forget Thelma's last name, but it's in the article, uh, Jared, that, that I wrote. Um, Thelma Smalls, was it? Sales, something like that. Look that up quickly. I'll give you two minutes. Anyway, this sister was actually someone who actually wrote uh, in the newspaper that was published um, in, in Malcolm's organization. Well, there, and there were others. So, but whenever you would read about Malcolm's life, Rarely did you, of course, you hear the influence of his mother and his sister, Ella, but you never, rarely, rarely, let me put it there, rarely did you hear about or read about his relationships with political women and his influence um, with political women, you know, and, and their, their influence up, among, up, uh, upon him. So when Jared's book was published, um, I felt that I, somebody contacted me about maybe did I want to uh, submit something because people knew um, my my work around just you know it, the whole question of how we are all asked her stories are always left out of everything you know and as black women we need to infuse ourselves whether they like it or not into these stories into these histories revolutionary women black radical mm -hmm. feminists okay mm -hmm. so. Um, I had done a um, presentation at the Schomburg of this very question of Malcolm X and, and women or something like that. So all I did, uh, Jared, was just to edit the, um, the presentation from the Schomburg and submit it to you. And I, don't, I guess your editors liked it and they published it. 
So that's how that happened. No, it was fantastic. And and I'm I'm sorry, I'm not seeing for some reason I'm not seeing the name that you uh, uh assigned me to find. Um Vicky. Uh, well, Vicky well, Garvin, Vicky. Yuri right. Kochiyama, uh Selma uh, Sparks. Selma Sparks. Selma that's Sparks. Her name. Okay, okay, right on. Yes. Uh I'm right. sorry I missed that. And uh Jill Humphreys. Yeah, anyway, okay. Um now, anyway. Queen Mother Moore have a a uh, I think she uh, yeah oh, you know, yes yeah. she had she had a very strong she had a great relationship. Thank you for raising that. I didn't include her. I don't know why. Uh, I may have, we probably mentioned her at the at the uh, at the um, the forum that was held, but I did not include her. But Queen Mother Moore was essential, not just for Malcolm, but so Max so Stanford. many of us. That's yeah, good. yeah. 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 And also Maya Angelou, Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, could you say more about your experiences as a Black woman in the party, a Black woman organizing? And also, if you have any thoughts on some of the gender conflicts, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it, right? No, you're right. But whatever. Just, going call it, just call it raw sexism, you know, and fundamentally uh, fomented by strong patriarchy, you know, destructive, you know. Um, yeah, I do that every <laughs> other day, but then on the alternate days, I'm wondering if, um, okay, I'll just throw it out here. How do you see this, uh, this switch to, um, a salvific black woman persona. I mean, I think it was Brianna Joy. I, I can't remember her name. The one who um, Brianna Joy Gray. Yeah, the the lead of uh, Bernie Sanders' second campaign, right? And so she's doing a podcast interview where she's being interviewed, and she makes a joke uh, about the phrase "believe black women." And she's like, yeah, I always laugh when I hear that because the black women, you know, not all of them, but a, a certain group don't believe me when I say that Sanders, you know, $15 mm -hmm. an hour, that, you know, universal health care, that the platform is worth supporting. So some black women are believable, other black women who, who uh, veer too far left or not. And I was just curious about how you see the progress that addresses patriarchy, misogynoir, misogyny, et cetera, but also does not mystify, you know, black women's leadership is as, as, as um, coherent because we're different, right? We have different politics, but d does it make sense what I'm asking you? Because I'm, I'm thinking a lot of names here, you know, Kamala Harris is VP, um, Keechan Sewell is the NYPD commissioner, Lori yeah. Light that is the black lesbian mayor. And I, I keep saying this and I'm, I'm trying not to be kicked out of the club, you know, as yeah. an anti-feminist because I'm not, I'm actually, hey, I'm, I'm in the club, I get to stay. But I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you see the complexity in terms of evolving analyses that, that can actually, the women that you called out were radical women leaders. Mm -hmm. But if the call now is just for women leaders and there's yes. no, you know, like, there's no modifier on that. And the modifier, the operative word there is modifier. There's, there's no politics, there's no political framework or no ideological framework that's emerging from these different, um, from these different, from, there is an ideological framework that is emerging, but it's not the ideological framework that embraced the women that we were talking about, women like Claudia Jones, or women like Vicki Garvin, or women like yourself, women like myself, many of the women who were in the Black Panther Party or the National Alliance of Third World Women, you know. Well, everybody, you know, we, we really got caught up in a sense of for, forgetting the, the significance and the importance of ideological training, ideological development. So many who rise or have risen to those choice places in, in our society embrace the capitalist system. They embrace imperialism. They, I mean, I sat, oh God, I sat in the UN 
uh, doing the debate uh, around uh, the question of around Cuba and um, but which for the past 30 years, countries have said, look, in the blockade, I go back there. But it was just amazing to watch the women from the African nations who were in positions of power and they, of course, they voted, um, let's end this blockade. When the leader at the, the, the black woman representative at the UN is denounced is, is through the through a black man, by the way, uh, read the reason why the U.S. would continue the the inhumane, illegal, all of those things blockade against Cuba. You know, and and so, you know, you kind of cringe um, because you know that even in this struggle where many of our sisters have risen to prominence, they 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 have done so on the back of an ideological viewpoint that embrace the this system that that oppresses us you know and then we and then they are put forward and as sacrificial lambs i mean on kamala was put forward to be the person to lay out what the immigration issue was going to be i mean i mean and that was like here we are struggling you know for uh, struggling to get people Haitians across the border to make sure that they're not returned, and and here that here our sister is supporting a racist um, perspective that's emanating from U.S. foreign policy. So it's a quandary. But I'm. But you know what, Joy? In every period of U.S. history, we've always had to deal with that. You know, each period of our history, our sisters who have risen to be in opposition fighting the system. So it's not something new, but right now you're right. We're in a we're in a historical period when it looks like, God, does anybody think like we do? You know, is that their viewpoint? Who gets who is who is who is who is the president's spokesperson? You know? Who comes on at night but Joy Reid, who who is so anti-communist, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. I, I cringe, you know, when I hear the things that she says, you know, um, uh, uh, who's propping up Ukraine, you know, and about democracy, but where is our voice? People like you and I, as black, as black women, where is our voice? The same way that our, the same way that our sisters before, when, when it wasn't, when things were not um, as electronically ruled as they are in terms of the media or what have you, they spoke out, they were ostracized. Some of them became political prisoners. I mean, we have a new generation of women who, who will have to make that choice. And we have, that's where the guerrilla university becomes important. It's, it, we have to raise with, with those that we're teaching that you have a choice right now and it's hard it's, it's, it's harder to walk that thin line between, between them and us. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just want to follow nice to also see Jared put in the chat, Corinne uh, Jean-Pierre, the, the Haitian. I mean, it's again, it's celebrated. It's in those first. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say a name. I, I wasn't going to raise it. I knew her name, but oh, I wasn't. Okay. Oh, is that why? Oh, my bad. I was saying, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, Jared, Jared, Jared got busted out of the. I was just trying to help with the roll call. No, man. No, I deliberately, I deliberately the anti roll call. <laughs> okay, that's not but fair. Anyway. Okay, we I, have to have ground rules going forward. When your own people are being sent back across the ocean, and you're gonna yeah, prop I mean, up. They should, it's Haiti. I mean, I have a former student, uh, you, um, from years ago who, I mean, I love the way you say like how many, the people you've mentored so much and it's so great to see what they do with their own lives, but they went and they got a JD as you did. And then now, you know, they work for some gas oil firm in Texas. So they make it more <laughs> money I'll ever see in my lifetime, but they volunteer to go into the ice camps in Texas and disproportionately it's the African, it's the Haitian and it's, right you know, that's being deported and that's being brutalized. And I think of mm. Don Wooten, right? On February 8th, we're gonna have an event, uh, a conversation at Williams College with Samaria Rice, Don Wooten, um, Joyce McMillan, who's trying to abolish foster care, who's based in New York City, and Amanda Wallace in Atlanta, who, you know, 
protested having been a social worker about the disproportionate removal of black children from families that are not dysfunctional. It's just like the state does capture. And then she got, because she protested at a black woman's judge house, the police like came for her. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm asking you cause you, you know, you're just like a font, you just ask Rosemary. I'm wondering, um, do we need to more sharply differentiate ourselves and just say we don't we don't agree? Because you've invoked Claudia Jones multiple times, and I think of her 1949 essay, right, in Public Affairs. Uh, I can't remember the title, but it's that for me was the first intersectional thing when she's writing to white communists, mostly men, about mm. how black women are treated. And she is a black woman who's from Trinidad. And also because she's from Trinidad, you know, after she's made into a political prisoner and, you know, they destroy her health, then the U.S., you know, um, they, force they, her. Force her. they force her out. And then Trinidad is like, we're not going to take her because she's a leftist. And so mm -hmm. she ends up in England. And then, you know, she dies, I think, maybe in her 50s or something. So that's a, a long way to say that the radical women have a, and I'm, and I'm going to exempt myself because, you know, I'm in, embedded, you know, in the academy. But radical communist women who are based in the community, it's sort of like the owner of the Hotel Teresa. I mean, there are penalties that come with being a radical who's committed to the community. And I'm wondering, it, well, so just do we start calling ourselves with some kind of descriptor that we're <laughs> communist black women or left it? We're not just black women anymore because the mm -hmm. zone of betrayal is, is so profound and you're right. And they send black women against black women. And then the mm. last thing I would say that's just like really ruining my days. I believe this is correct. Um, the CIA put a statue of Harriet Tubman in their quad and now mm. they're claiming there is a black woman is the first spy. Mm -hmm. And they also did recruitment for, you know, <laughs> black lesbians to join with like rainbow flag, <laughs> join the CIA. <laughs> Everything that we stand for is it's like um, the rabbit we get co -op Yeah, we right. get co-opted. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it did, I don't know. Is it just me and is this public therapy now? Does it like no. hurt in a certain way that, that the representation of being a Black woman or Black feminist seems to be working for empire more easily than I thought it would be? No, I think you're absolutely right. Is it, it is working for empire. At the point that they would put a gun on a gun on her her shoulder or in her hands or two pistols, I'm talking. And they, about. She wouldn't shoot them, right? It's just she works for us. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you. I. It it can get. I know what you mean about needing daily therapy. You know, I call my friend Myrna all the time. I need it. You know, because you begin to question. Um, wow. It's, Am I on the am I somehow on the wrong side when I can be critical of my brothers who are still misogynistic and 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 serving patriarchy or in organizations? I mean, what what is it about us, you know, that that makes us think so differently, you know, and 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 come out on the right side? I think about it a lot, and 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 I I think the only way the only way that we can Maintain our sanity, in a sense, in this in this thing is to go go to Cuba, where women are struggling, and, it, and every day. I mean, it's such a lesson. I mean, I keep bringing up Cuba. You know, like when my son grew up. You know, he used to call. <clears throat> we lived in Philly, and he used to call the his 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 peers called me the Cuba lady. You know, but. One thing when you go when you go there, you begin to talk to to women who who are experiencing patriarchy, but at least there's a struggle going on, and they can raise it in the context of the socialist context. Who's struggling against racism? True, there's a whole group of women now called uh, Afrofeministas. Afrofeministas uh, all over the country. They're embracing uh, teaching, going into the, and they also call themselves. Uh, activists, activists, um, scholars, which is something that we can't, have, you know, we don't use even use that term, activist scholars. But when you go outside of the United States in a place like that, you begin to see 
that you're not alone. And that's where the international peace becomes so important because you realize that you can become so, so emotionally and mentally isolated as a black woman who's trying to do the right thing in this country, in this context of this society, that, you know, sometimes you say, well, is it worth it, you know? But then when my 17 year old, I have a 17 year old uh, granddaughter too, Jared, when my 17 year old writes an essay about what is a revolutionary, you know, and she defines it a little differently than the way we would, you know, um, I, I have hope, you know, I have hope. And I think that that's what, that, that is what keeps me energized, you know, or when my, when my, one of my PhD students who's now teaching in a place like Kentucky can stop by to visit and she can talk about what she's doing and the, and in, in academia and the struggles that she's encountering, but yet she's hanging in there and, and she's trying to teach, you know, it, it, it does give you a sense of hope. I think that we need, we need to rebuild our community of these folks like us, especially women, you know, and, um, and that's, that's what I, that's what I work. That's what I'm working towards or have been doing, you know, so to, I don't know to, if that. Yeah. Yes, that, brother. That's very yeah. helpful. No, I, I was going to say to your point, right. We, um, the oftentimes the, the certain women, who are who are raised up for lack of better words, right? And then you have folks like the Fulani Sunni Ali's, um, you know, yourself and Mama and Jenga, who is uh ill right now, you know, get well to her. But you have so many uh women that that I've learned from that um they've made all types of efforts to to bury, you know, and there's certain women who um through my research and studies, it seems to me, and I, I could be wrong, but it seems like the folks who have worked hardest in our movement, particularly women, um, are often denied access um, while others are, you know, they move on to be major professors and, you know, and they're getting all types of different resources and funding, so on and so forth. Why do you think that is? And, and, I, and I do also want to go back to <laughs> the question that Jared asked in regards to the newspaper situation. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Look, I just want to raise one thing. I think that it's important that we deal with our mental health. Uh, that's critical, and our physical health. You know, I you, and that's something that we a lot of times that we just dismiss and we don't do it. And a lot of the women my generation who were in those movements, I mean, we're walking with strollers. You know, we're going to to the doctors, kidney illnesses, and all that. But there's no, it's never too late to try to strengthen yourself physically, you know. So I walk, I do yoga, I meditate, I go to the gym three times a week. You know, not the hardcore stuff, but, um, you know, intermittently training. You have, to, you have to be physically fit in order to be able to, to mentally drive yourself forward, you know. And that's important. That's, that's area that a lot of us, we dismiss. You know, we dismissed in the past and we're suffering now. And I think that that's something that we can impart on these, these new group of sisters that we're, that we're um, recruiting to Guerrilla University, okay? To take care of your physical health, not go overboard, but at least just, even if it just means you walk for 15 minutes a day, that's, that's important because that kind of information was not passed on to us in the in quote unquote the movement seriously something as simple as that you know about your health okay so that's that's one thing that, that we have to deal with why is it that some of the sisters have been able to acquire a pension um, of working in the university they're getting um, they're getting grants and what have you that's they, that's a choice that people make you know and 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 you have to say to yourself. Am I making that choice at the expense of devaluing who I am and what I believe in? You know, can you hold on to your values and yet work within that construct? 
Some people have been able to do that. Joy is able to do that, you know, not with probably uh, a lot of soul searching every day. I was not, I was not able to do that, you know, because I, I was already out there as an activist. And so by the time I would go to apply for a job or something, I, I, this history was behind me, you know? And so I had to accept that. I had to accept that, that even, you know, they, they said, well, I'm personalizing it, but I can share this. First, I said, okay, having a JD, I went to law school because I really wanted, I really wanted to know how this system really worked and how I could, how, how I could use law in the service of, in the interest of the people, which is the motto of CUNY Law School and also as a member of the National Council, Conference of Black Lawyers. Um, so that was a deliberate thing on, on my part. But then I realized after I graduated from law school that I couldn't get a job in the academy because a JD is not considered um, a, a, an academic de degree for the academy unless you have a lot of experience. So I had to find other ways to utilize my, my, my law school uh, experience. So then I get the PhD, um, but by the time I get that, ageism creeps in, right? So who's gonna hire a, uh, a 60, 65 year old PhD, right? So, you know, you have to deal with that. So you, you then begin to say, okay, well, let me just take all these skills that I have and let me just figure out a way that I can apply everything in my activism work, okay? And so the trade-off in doing that was that I don't write a lot, you know? Uh, I mean, if I could get a grant to just do some more writing about the questions that we're raising here, I would do that, but, but, but people like me, and there are many of us out there, we need, a, we need affiliations with a university, right? So getting back to the university Professor that recognizes- Neely, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's one other thing I think you left out is that what? even when you get the PhD and get the appointment, <laughs> black women are wildly underpaid vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, in many cases, even black men, even at HBCUs. So sorry right. for that interruption, but just- Oh, that's to... okay. That's okay. Like a reminder. <laughs> but I was willing to take the pay cut at an HBCU. <laughs> um, so, you know, just, it, it's, it's like a rough road to travel brothers and sisters. Um, but in the end, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. Um, because we know that, that when we leave out of here, whether we write our memoirs or not, um, we leave out of here having passed it on, as Asata would say, we did pass it on. And hopefully there's enough that's being passed on that generates a lot of fire in the next generation. I think it's the next generation that's gonna carry it forth. It's the next generation. I really believe that. I really believe that. Um, would you, and on that, yes. Is there, I'm sorry, is there a way to squeeze in one, at least one, uh, if I could just, I'm very, I'm I'm just wanting to hear if you would say a word or two about what your work on reminding us of the 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 well the memories of Fidel meeting Malcolm what what that has to say about not only uh, broadly speaking black internationalism which I think you've touched on but but the specifics of the black and brown in, inter uh, the relationships between black and brown communities which obviously continues to be torn apart. Uh, by those who would prefer to see the disunity, but if could you say a word or two about what that Castro Malcolm meeting means in terms of that history? Right. Well, it means a lot because what I'm seeing now is um, a reawakening uh, interest in the book, in the meeting, and a lot of that I think stems from the from the the kinds of things that you and I are doing here. Um, my my going, you know, I look at I look at there's some colleges and universities, believe it or not, where the teachers have incorporated it into their texts, which is great. Uh, sometimes you go and you cite PhDs, theses that have cited your work. So I think it's it's being carried on on that level. And this is just not just in English English language um, context, but across the board, even French. Um, I think also, and, and it's, I also think that, um, for example, 
I'm do, I've started embarking on doing um, presentations that actually raise the question, how does the book have relevance today? How does that meeting have relevance today that goes beyond Cuba and, and beyond Malcolm and Fidel? For example, coming up uh, be, on the 12th of February at the People's Forum in um, New York, I'm actually doing what's called an intergenerational discussion about the text of the book, where I'm having a young scholar who, who mentors to actually discuss how we can take that history and translate it into the work that, that they're doing in a, at, at a museum called the Poster Museum. And, that's, and, and I understand that with, in other parts of the country, people are just taking it on their own to use the text to raise that question, what is the relevance, like you said, of, of the um, meeting in 1960 to the reality now. There's a lot of things that we can, can learn from that meeting. We learned from that meeting that there are distinct ide ideological viewpoints that both of those men embraced. There's the issue of international solidarity by the fact of who came to visit the Teresa Hotel for those 10 days during the meeting of the UN. There's lessons to be learned in terms of, of, of the, even the woman's question, you know, as it relates to both men, you can interrogate Fidel's relationship to women and, and, and the new family code that exists now in Cuba where they've erased, I mean, you gotta read this family code that, that was passed. It's just amazing. It's, it's, a, it's a map for the, for the progressive world, you know, where redefining what is the family, you know, that it's just not this nuclear, situation here. It's gay, lesbian, bi, bi, um, bi, biracial children, uh, grandmothers, grandparents. It, it has expanded the meaning of the family, the family, and, and, and within the context of contemporary society. So there's a lot that you can take from the history of this book and translate it to now. And some of the points that I, I, have, I have raised there are how we're doing that. Right on, man. You have uh, your your information and and what you've shared today is um is 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 beyond powerful. So definitely, um, we're grateful to uh, have you here uh, at GIU, and we know that it's so much more that you can offer. So definitely, this this won't be your last time here. Um, and you know, I'm bold to say that without asking, but you know. We have uh, we have work to do, and we're grateful for the work that you've done. I want to. Um, <clears throat> can can I know. just say one thing? Sure, sure. May I say, I, I I'm constantly looking at Mumia in the background there. You know, mm -hmm. I knew him when he was 14 years old. We were in the party together, and and in one of his books, he talks about the role of of women in the Black Panther Party, and he really helps to formulate and shape shape that because we didn't really get into that but i would encourage people to read his his works because he, he is a, a magnificent brother and we need to he we need to free him you know okay. and um and then just condolences to him who he just recently lost his his wife a couple of weeks ago right. i, I want to since you raised that and i'm glad because that was a question i had that um <laughs> one, of the, one of the many. I, I was going to ask you, I know that, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you joined the party after the assassination of Chairman Fred, correct? Yes, that was the motivation. One of the motivations for why I joined the party. Um, now, did did you join? I'm sorry, did you go with, I mean, I know Mumia had went into the uh, house at 14. Were you there as well? or? Well, actually, uh, Mumia was in the Mumia and I, he was he actually drove with us to Chicago um, mm. and, and because I wasn't in the party then, but we had access to automobiles because I lived in a commune <laughs> with white mother country radicals. Uh, that's the terminology <laughs> that people can, <laughs> that people can, <laughs> that people can investigate. But um, yes, we went out to Chicago together. And um, when we I'm not sure if he was. I know he was in Chicago with us, but I'm not sure if he went to the house the same day that I went there. 
And when I went into that house, and I always tell people the image is still there. I looked down on the floor. There were these blood-stained mattresses, uh, pock marks in the wall with the gun bullets and everything. And when I went back to Philadelphia, I had been working as a therapist at, at Child Guidance Clinic, a family therapist. And I never went back to, um, to that job. So that's a pension that I lost, OK? Um, I never went back to that job. And I immediately joined the Black Panther. I officially joined the Black Panther Party right after that. And the rest is some history that people can read about. Right on, right on. And to the to the uh, unauthorized biographers, you are all welcome <laughs> for that contribution yeah, we, we, to the we, we to the greater drop, body yeah. of work. You're, you're, that's right. You're, yeah, you're, stop you're playing with us. Right I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you to virtually, you know, so you don't have to leave comfort zone and your beautiful art uh, to speak to my class. I'm doing a, a seminar on the Black Panther Party. I would really like to hear about your analyses and your contributions, but also, I mean, what you just said, you know, about the assassination for, I'm sure everybody on this platform knows, but, you know, December 4, 1969, joint Chicago Police Department, FBI, uh, Mark Clark and Fred Hampton, right? And later there's like some monetary settlement that goes to the families. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. I'm kind of stunned by what you said that, you know, what you witnessed and uh, and how that transformed you. And I guess sometimes it is is the horror and the trauma that pushes us to the next level. And then that's where we find community and, you know, and different forms of commitment. So I know Kalanji has a, a question, but I just want to tell you again how much I appreciate you. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to come to your your class virtually. Yes. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, see, we, we, we got so many different roads to go down um, and, and definitely rising power to uh, Captain uh, Reggie Sh uh, Shell out of uh, Philly as well, who we had the opportunity to spend some time with some years ago. Um, we know that uh, you're also an artist. Mm. You are a poet. Uh, and, of, so of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have to be a poet if you're a freedom fighter, right? I mean, it's like... It's, it's poetic by nature. Um, I don't know. I, I sent you an email. I don't know if you are uh, up for the challenge, but I had heard one of your pieces. And um, and, and usually when we have uh, artists on the platform, not calling you an artist, but, you know, um, you're an artist as well. Uh, I usually um, ask that they deliver some uh, some lyrics for us. So if you don't mind today sharing with us, I think that would be awesome. See, I'm I'm a I'm a bold guy. Everybody else sitting there, I can't believe you asked her to do this. But um, <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> well, I, I thank you, thank you, Kalanji. I did pull it up. Um, yes, I was actually it was my first commission. Uh, I was commissioned by um, a sister named uh, Gwen McKinney, who is very important. A sister journalist. Um, she created a um, a platform called. Um, uh, 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 actually, it's it's really an interesting platform because it's about er unerased, you know, and where she has speakers coming in, um, talking, and she's done an excellent job of uh, of developing the platform. So she asked me if I would. Um, we did a we did. I was working with them, and she asked me if I would do something for Juneteenth, and this was I think this was just before um, a Biden. Uh, read the proclamation about Juneteenth. So I, it may, there's a, I, I, I changed the standards at the end, but I'm not sure which version I'll be reading from, but thank you so much for asking me. This is the last poem that, by the way, that I've written. I only write. You, you, you faded out all of a sudden. You muted, you muted yourself. Miss Me Professor Mealy, you've muted yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, it says your mic. There you go. There you go. I was going to say this is the wrong time to mute yourself, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the poem is called Juneteenth Reparations. Anchored across the plains some thousands of miles away, 
the eagle lost its wings and the homing pigeon detoured northward with the message that Lincoln's proclamation had freed the slaves. Scorched earth embraced the feet of children still picking cotton, their thirst relieved by a black mother's finger frosted with her own saliva. Black men's bodies hanging from trees, green moss below encrusted with blood, scenes replicated throughout the South by the losers who in their hatred cut fingers, toes, genitalia, and other body parts as souvenirs for the cadavers. The thought of those who they once sold, bartered and raped in their twisted and unholy minds would now make them the victims of prey. Anchored across the plains some thousands of miles away, the eagle lost its wings and the homing pigeon detoured northward with the message that Lincoln had freed the slaves. In the state of Texas, along the Brazos River and Galveston town, the slave market flourished. Fertile grounds worked by the enslaved black women toiling in the sugarcane and cotton mills in the kitchens and hotels created fortunes for their owners. Documents of slave transactions in Galveston town like the human traffickers of today are namely identified of those who committed this horrendous crime against humanity. Some of whom descendants claim the surnames of Ballinger, Briggs, and Houston, Kaufman, Mills, and Austin, and the Bible-toting Charles Sayer, who owned 24 slaves and 6,000 acres of land. Anchored across the plains some thousands of miles away, the eagle lost its wings, and the homing pigeon detoured northward with the message that Lincoln's proclamation had freed the enslaved. Meanwhile, ships kept sailing from Galveston's ports to Boston, New York, Charleston, Richmond, Europe, and Cuba too. Transporting bales of cotton, sugar, and molasses, black labor extracted, black labor resisted, broken and beaten, whiplash backs tell the stories of how wealth was created, massive plantations flourished, insurance companies were built, and slavery in Texas continued. Who kept the secret? Who destroyed the proclamation? How about the politicians and men like Julius Kaufman? He purchased Louisa, age 30, an eight-year-old boy, and a six-month-old baby wrenched from its mother's arms. A documented sale occurred in Galveston, May 13, 1865. Then, as planting season was over and the crops had been gathered, Two and a half years later, a long march and endless detours anchored across the plains from some thousands of miles away on horseback this time, General Gavinster casually rode into Calveston and announced on June 19, 1865, all slaves are free. Some left, others wandered the horizons throughout and beyond looking for loved ones, lost families, daughters, and sons. Those who stayed were jubilant, history framed scenes of celebrations. Today, 46 plus states and the nation's capital acknowledge Juneteenth as a state of ceremonial holiday. Parades and picnics, murals and markers are bound in Galveston, but reparations are still a distant dream to be fought for. We must make real as the central demand. This would be the ultimate praise songs for our ancestors anchored across the seas. Right on, right on. We appreciate that. You got Dr. Ball snapping in the background, <laughs> Dr. James snapping in the background, and I'm clapping. Bo thank you, thank you. So we say right here. Bo Definitely yeah, appreciate thank you very you much. Delivering that. That was a, a, a powerful way to uh to close out today's program, I want to know, we want to know how can we get um, folks in the chat, get copies of the book. 
um the of course that we know the english translation is available here um you know yeah and if you have uh a way to contact your website or whatever you know we're welcome we're open to it okay i sent um, a link to the uh, uh contact black classic press okay, okay. I think I included, Joy, I may have included those links in a response to you. We'll make oh, sure okay. it's in the show description so that people okay. can okay. just look below and click, 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 click. Yeah. And, thank um, you very much. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, contact you all. and You can contact. <laughs> you can become my PR people. Um, <laughs> yes, what we do. We got you. This is, this is okay. what we do. Um, you can then they can then contact me. But there's one thing I really would like you all to do. Um, you need to read a copy of that second book, uh, the one about uh, the expulsions from black historical colleges and universities. Um, that's an important, important book that never got any play at all because it's a library book and it's pretty pricey. But what I do in that book is actually talk about what happened to nine brothers and sisters, by the way, who were expelled from historically black colleges and universities for participating in the sit-in movements. And this is a history that, a little known history that many of us don't know about. So with um, the, the sit-in coming, the anniversary of the sit-ins coming up, it's mm -hmm. a, it might be a good read. So you can check that book out at your local library if, um, if folk, um, Hopefully the library will have a is copy. The the book you did with, with, with Bill Sales, is that what it is? is oh that... Bill Sales, no. Well Bill Sales was act, actually my um he was Oh it's, he it's was, it lists him as a forward writer. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah, he did he, he was my committee chair, by the way. So um it was it was important for him to do the forward. Yeah. Oh okay. right on. Yeah, I, I would love to read that, but we have to we do have to find some um yeah, we have to find that library copy because that, that but that, don't don't that. go online to buy it because I think it's something like $175 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I see twice that. They they try it's almost like the radical literature gets so overpriced nobody can get it. <laughs> but we'll right. we'll find a copy and we will have you back to um yeah. talk with us about it as well. Well, actually, you could actually order it directly from Mellon Press. You could get a um uh you could get don't order a hardback copy. Just get a regular copy. I think you could get it. Right on. Well, we'll get all the information and put it in the uh, in the show notes. Again, okay. we, we we appreciate um, you being uh, our first professor we're drafting here at Guerrilla Intellectual University. Um, you know, anyone opposed? No? Okay. <laughs> Looks like a go. It's all right. Okay. Oh, wow. Gratitude. Look at me. I got my own little thing, up, my own little insignia up there. Oh, that's great. That looks good. I can put that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Solidify your place in the margins. You know what I mean? It'll be your last job. No need to worry. And uh, GIUs helps to see you offshore. Okay. As the spirit, you know, it's like, how does this work? We will definitely figure that out. Okay, um, great. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Love. Thank you. Thank brothers. you very and much. Thanks. And thanks to everybody in the audience as well. Thanks to our colleagues and comrades as, uh, who are watching this and those who will see this here later. Peace as you're willing to fight for it, as Fred Hampton used to say as well. Right on. Yes. Right. Thank you. We out. Peace. <laughs>